This talk is about what CISOs are doing in the complicated field of working with developers and uh, DevSecOps, or trying to build Sec into that DevOps. And this will be very rewarding because you're going to hear from people who have been working in it, this for several years and have various levels of success. And we'll hopefully get some guidelines for you folks so you can share some of their pain but some of their glory and how we're moving forward. And so um, what we've all agreed to do is uh, I have, we have some questions that I will ask them that hopefully will get to the crux of the issue and be helpful. But if anyone here has a question during this whole panel experience, feel free to raise your hand, right? Because there's no need to just wait to the end. This is a good opportunity for you to interact with, with some CISOs and who've had real world experience with this, not theory, not textbook, not, it, you know, not just the thoughts, but you know, they're living it. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna start and um, let's hear what our experts have to say. So the first question, what were some of the biggest challenges you have encountered in trying to bake security <clears throat> into the SDLC? And how did you go about overcoming them? What are some of the free tips that you can share? So uh, Shama, why don't you ta tackle that one first? <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you can hear me okay back there? Okay, cool. Um, when I think about SDLC and I think, you know, when you, when you look at conferences like, like AppSec, Cali, um, you tend to attend talks that talk about continuous integration and developer adoption and all of our focus has, in my opinion, <laughs> uh, really been focused internally to our organizations, right? We're looking a lot at how we're integrating with our developers and uh, how we're looking at getting the business involved and so forth. Um, Lately, I've been taking a really big look because I'm in the financial space at what my peers are doing and what warnings they are issuing um, and even what the government is issuing um, as far as things we should be looking out for too. I think um, last quarter, Q4, there was a warning, I think from the DHS about supplier security. Um, and it got me thinking, well, what are these threats and uh, how am I looking at this, right? Like how, I, how do I take this vague warning from the DHS on supplier security and integrate that into my SDLC? What does that actually look like? And I think we saw a manifestation of that warning with MageCard, right? Um, and that, that's kind of a multi-pronged problem, right? We've got the supplier due diligence problem. We've got um, inclusion attacks, which can be boiled down to integrity checking and bypassing controls and everything from the infrastructure all the way up to the application side. So um, that to me is kind of a problem that's really difficult to solve because you know, just like most attacks are, it's bypassing all of our controls, but it's bypassing a trusted uh, supplier. So we can do the spreadsheet jockey with, <laughs> with our suppliers and make them fill out the spreadsheet and do the on-site visits and all that kind of stuff. But where is it that we get comfortable with them um, to start trusting those inclusions within our source code itself? So um, I would really, there's a talk later today about threat modeling suppliers, which I think is going to be really interesting. And I'm excited to go to that one to see how they're tackling it from from the threat modeling perspective. But when do we go back and start looking at these inclusions? Are we doing file integrity monitoring on, on the server side? Is that how we're going to solve this problem? So um, that's something that I'm kind of struggling with, trying to figure out the solution to that. I don't know if we have that in a nice package box. <laughs> but. Yeah, I, I would, would agree that um, these problems are hard. We may not have all the answers. We struggle with this every day, right? Um, how do you trust your suppliers? Um, how do you trust your supplier's supplier? And who in the entire life cycle of an application is really thinking about security? Because when you take a look at security, and the, the talk earlier was really good, and I agree with one thing, security is a trade-off not between being secure or insecure, but being secure or usable. 
And most times the business is going to win on usability and security is going to lose. And at some point, that's where we get into problems. And that's the trade-off as a security professional that I have to, to try and balance is I've got all this usability things that I need to make because we're, you know, my company is not a security company. We do insurance. They could care less about security. They care about revenue, just like your company. And how do we enable that? Well, at the same time, take these really interesting things that we get from the DHS that says big, big bad things are happening, and how do we translate that into what we have to do every day? More importantly, what you guys have to do every day. Yeah, just a couple comments. I think um, when I think about you know an SDLC program in a corporate environment, um, I think the first thing I think about, and honestly, it's not technical, it's the cultural impact. So you know you gotta, you hire some really great security guys, and a couple of my guys are in the, in here today. Um, really super smart, and the first thing they're going to do is walk over to the developers and say, "Your baby's ugly." Um, <laughs> and 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 the first thing the developer says is, "No, my baby's pretty." So you got to start with the culture. Um, your, the, the culture aspect is important. Um, you, you know, the, the, you know, the euphemistic DevOps world and is, is really a cultural discussion. It's not really a technical discussion. Taking some of those principles about how to embed teams, how to make them comfortable that they're there to help. There's lots of tools and processes and a lot of automation discussions that are going on in, in this space to, to make everybody's life better. But the end state, it is a people discussion and start with that cultural integration. Did you? Embedding SGLC. Um, so I, I work at Segment in San Francisco. It's a startup. Um, it's my second one up there. And um, going into a startup, you really never know how people are going to receive security because people have heard things or had different experiences. And you're like, okay, well, I know I have this job to do and I have to do it with these people and they may not want to hear it. They're probably smarter than I am. Um, what, how do we do this? And so I would definitely like to double down on like, it's the people, it's the culture side of it because you could have the best AppSec program in the world. You could do SDLC really, really well at your previous place. You go to a new place and it's a completely new area. They don't know who you are. They don't trust you, but they suspect that you're there to slow them down. So figuring out what their workflow looks like and the things that you want to do, being able to embed these different things within their workflow so they don't feel like you're telling them no. They don't feel like you're giving them a whole bunch of extra work. They feel like you're actually weaving it into their day-to-day -day that's already happening. Um, I think that that's really important. And spending time with them, like um, my team came up with the idea of doing uh, like a two-way embed. So the first thing that we're gonna do is figure out what they struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis. Why is it really slow to deploy code? Uh, what, what do they have to deal with? And so someone will go for a sprint or two or a part of a quarter um, and build something with them side by side. And it's not there to just receive the security tickets that we submitted before and work on them, but is actually building something with them. Um, and then what ends up happening is when that person leaves from that group, the mark that they leave is like, this is, I've modeled how to do um, software development securely with you and you can copy everything that we've done. And usually, um, so if that person is Leaf who's sitting back there, Leaf will find uh, like, okay, while I was there, I found these one or two people who are really great security champions and we can work with them to make sure that the SDLC is followed, that the activities that we want actually happen. Um, and then down the road, um, after we have some these chances to embed with these different teams, we're going to have different teams embed with the security team and build something together. Um, so the closer you can bring in the rest of your R and D or you know engineering, product and design folks, the better it is because you should not be seen as separate. You should be seen as a partner um, and a critical piece of how they build things. Yeah, you know, one of the things that um, that I've done is um, meet right up front with the head of uh, the application development area, take them to lunch. You know, as a good CISO, we're, we spend a little out of pocket funds as we take people to lunch because first impressions are crucial. You will be remembered three years down the road by a person who said, yeah, he took me to lunch. So that buys you a lot of grace initially. Um, but it's important because you have to establish a dialogue and a, an exchange with this person who you're going to be working quite closely with uh, because our role is to you know ensure security in a, in a field where there you know the, a lot of people in the security field aren't coders right and so there's a little gap there so we are dependent upon 
you know, things that's just you just brought up, working with these other teams. Um, so, you know, the culture's key, right? This isn't a technical issue, as Bruce said. It is um, people. So now we have a, a full group. I want to give each person a chance to tell you a little bit about themselves. And I think that would be helpful with the context. So, Colleen, why don't you start off? Sorry for being late, guys. For some reason, I thought I was supposed to be here at 11, so <laughs> totally my fault. Um, apologize. No problem. Um, as I mentioned before, my name is Colleen, and I am up in San Francisco. Um, this is the second startup that I've been trying to do this, this thing. I've got this crazy idea. Um, a security person's life is already very hard. You have chosen a hard road. Why did you do that to yourself? Um, but I just had this idea that it would be really fun to build up security programs from scratch at a pre-IPO company. So it's imagine this company is like a baby and it's just like, tell me everything you want to do. That's, that's the fantasy that I have that they're gonna be really welcoming to having a security team guide them through this process. And uh, is that really true? Yes and no, depends on the day. There are days when they come to us and they say, can you tell us how you want us to do this thing? And we'll look at each other like, that doesn't normally happen if we worked at a bank. That's really strange that they just gave up their right to choose, but fine, we'll tell you how to do it. Um, so the fun thing is uh, starting at these small companies who maybe didn't have an introduction to security at all, they, they've never worked with security people, and then showing them this is, this is how you work with a security team. This is the benefit of having a security team by your side and helping you make sure that you put out the best quality product you possibly can. Um, so I did that at Twilio. Um, I also, I'm doing that right now at Segment. Um, it's really fun building the team and it's building the programs. Um, the hard side of it is that you're working with people who have probably never worked with security people before. So the things that you think that they should know, like do you scan your code for flaws? And when someone does that, you'll probably get a ticket, which means you need to fix that. Like those are novel concepts to people who have never worked with security teams before. So on the one hand, they're really lovely. Like they'll look to you for all kinds of guidance and instruction because they're not, you know, they're not burned out. Um, on the other hand, sometimes they have no idea what the basics are about. So it's been fun. Um, my name's Shama, and I'm the CISO for Avant. We are a financial company, but not a bank. So that lends some interesting problems <laughs> and solutions. Um, <clears throat> I come from a pen testing background. I started out as a pen tester, um, specifically for applications. And then <clears throat> I moved to the corporate side um, because I wanted to make significant change and see it all the way through to the end to make sure that uh, the recommendations that I was making were actually getting implemented. So. Excuse me. So I switched over to um, being an application security manager and building out AppSec programs as well too. And that kind of morphed into me taking on more responsibilities and more programs outside of AppSec, which ends up being in a CISO role. Um, so um, I, I kind of really enjoy the infrastructure side now, which is something I, I wasn't really entirely sure I would like. Um, but I find it to be uh, this day and age. I think we're we're doing a lot more on infrastructure than than we have maybe in the past. So I'm Martin Mazur, I'm the CISO for Entertainment Partners. We are a payroll and uh, technology company for the entertainment industry. I've held the uh, CISO title for over about over 20 years, um, Fortune 100, uh, aerospace and defense, and uh, uh, some other engineering functions. Um, what I enjoy about being a CISO, well, I got the weird, weird world of, I also run IT. I'm one of the rare, rare CISOs that run IT as well. Um, so it's it's a very positive aspect because security is embedded up front. I don't, you know, it was a joke. I kind of battle with myself. I yell at myself because, um, but um, it, it, the, the value there, and I think it's an interesting point, is, you know, the integrated security models are up front. We can't get away from security because it's not outside IT. IT and security need to be embedded. Uh, what I really enjoy about uh, security is understanding customer concerns, and I hear them a lot, and trying to figure out how to, how to make their world better. Um, I know it sounds kind of a political answer, but it really is part of what I enjoy to do is, is hearing what customers like to see in our products and how we operate. Uh, being a service provider, we get a lot of input um, and trying to take those and, and turn them into viable products and viable uh, activities for our customers. So that's, that's what I enjoy doing. Cool, my name is Bruce Phillips. I'm a Chief Information Security Officer for the Williston Financial Group of Companies. Um, I haven't been a CISO quite as long as Martin, so yay. 
Um, I, I, I don't own IT, so I don't get to yell at myself every day, um, which I'm grateful for. I started out as a developer when I got into IT a long time ago. Um, I actually got um, hooked into OWASP by, by a guy by the name of Mark Curfee. Um, a few years ago and, and, and other people that, that have really struggled with and, and helped frame AppSec from about 10, 15, 20 years ago, um, which keeps AppSec at the front of my mind. I do not envy you guys for your job because you guys are in a tough position, right? The business want things done today. You want to build good product and somebody like me is going, oh yeah, make it secure. And we don't, we don't really tell you what that means. Um, but you guys are the help that we need because you're all here trying to understand AppSec. So I have, applaud all you guys for being here. Um, I've, I'm passionate about security. I'm passionate about protecting consumers. Most of my day is not really dealt, dealing with application security. My, my, most of my day, every day, is dealing with consumers who lose money through wire fraud and real estate transactions. Those things drive me crazy, and it's the infrastructure and it's the applications that we all use that enable the criminals to be successful to the tune of probably $1.2 billion last year was lost by consumers to wire fraud. That's why I'm passionate about that, and that's why I'm here, and that's why I applaud all of you guys for being here. I'm Rich Greenberg. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm, the, uh, I'm on the OWASP Global Board of Directors, um, but my day job that helps pay the mortgage, because that's volunteer work, is I, I'm a CISO. I, I've been doing this for about 15 years. Um, I don't think I'll ever catch you, Martin. <laughs> Got a head start. Um, I've been at the, the L.A. County Department of Health Services, which is all about hospitals. And then um, I started there as one person and built up a, a team, built the security program from scratch. All I got to say is thank goodness for the HIPAA regulation. Uh, that kind of pushed them and forced them to appoint a security officer. Um, and once that program was built, I moved over to the Department of Public Health, which had no security at all. Built that from scratch, so pretty lucky right? Because many CISOs don't have that opportunity. They go into a place that's already got it, particularly today, but we're going back. Uh, this was several years ago. Um, so I've had that great pleasure to build up an, yet another program and hired new staff, convinced the top management, I need people, I need a team, I need contractors, I need budget, and we've pushed out programs. Uh, so it's been quite a challenge, as Bruce mentions. Uh, it's always going to be that way. Um, but I think I'm, I'm very happy with some of the successes. I, I don't try to talk publicly about some of the issues we're still working on, but hopefully we'll get to those. Uh, budget's always an issue, but you have to figure out ways to talk to upper management. Um, but this panel is more about talking to application development. I'm one of the few people at the conference probably that it's not a coder. I came up through IT. I was a systems administrator managing Novell. Yes. And, and, and Microsoft Networks. Um, I think that if we hadn't switched over to Microsoft, my Novell network would still be up. <laughs> but anyway, that's another time. And we can talk more about that over drinks later. But just to help us out here a little bit, those of you who are primarily developers, can you raise your hand? Higher, so we get a feel, okay. Those of you who are in security, please raise your hand. Okay, that's what we suspected, so we're at the right audience. But developers, thank you for coming. What we really want for this conference is more developers, and we want more of developers to drink the security Kool-Aid, right? So that's all, that's all of our roles here, to get them involved. All right, so let's, let's get back. We have uh, some more questions to ask our esteemed panel. So the next question is, how does DevOps change the game, and how do you make that DevSecOps? Um, Bruce, you and I had some chat about this, and we were on a we were at a, a great little dinner conversation with a bunch of other people about this uh, about a month or two ago. I was impressed with what he had to say, and that, I said I got to have him on this panel. So thank you for coming. But what are your thoughts? I wish I could remember what I said. It must <laughs> have been really good. Remember you eating, drinking that drinking? I, yeah, I was drinking the yeah, wine, yeah. and yeah. There, there, there. Um, DevOps to DevSecOps, and, and I'm going to go back in time a little bit and think about. Back in the day when I was a developer, um, and what we did was we developed applications. 
And when they were done, we threw them over the fence. Somebody else dealt with them. And they never worked. Because, you know, we built it in our own little cocoon that had all the services and all the ports and all the protocols and everything that we wanted it to do. But we didn't tell anybody because we didn't really pay attention to what we really needed. And we just threw it over the wall and they had to struggle with it. And there was the, in, the initial fight wasn't between developers and security, it was developers and IT operations because we made their life miserable and they broke our applications and it was their fault. So now we move forward and we say, well, how do we get past that, right? Well, we got to this idea of DevOps, where we're starting to put it together, where the teams now work together, and you're, you're, you're trying to overcome the hurdles that we had back in the early days of just throwing things over the wall and see what happens. That's culture. Exactly what Marty said is that that culture needs to be developed where those gr groups are working together. And now today, we start talking about DevSecOps. What the heck is that? And that was probably the most intelligent thing I said the, uh, at that dinner was, I've been hearing people tell me about DevSecOps. I've had multiple conversations about DevSecOps. And not two people have told me the same thing about what DevSecOps is. So I'm gonna give you sort of my idea of what it might be. And it might be the perfect world where the security team and the operations team and the development team all get together around a nice campfire, sing kumbaya and come together and build applications that meet the need of the business and protect the consumers and our shareholders. Sounds like a fairy tale. I think that's where we need to go. I think that's why we're starting to talk now about DevSecOps. There's a lot of discussions about SDLC and how does SDLC put in there um, and all of the other different ways that you can do it. But at the end of the day, it's the culture is how you as an organization can come together and meet the, the, the needs that you all have and help your company survive and, and, and thrive. So I don't know, and if, if you guys have the great idea, please let me know. I really want to come up with a good definition of DevSecOps. And how does this play together in a perfect world? Now, there is no perfect world, right? There's always going to be problems. And I will tell you my personal opinion on the problem with DevSecOps. It doesn't include the business. And our number one challenge is getting the business to understand the complexity of building the applications that we try to run things on. So I think there's something coming, DevSecBizOps. Let's see how many more things we can put in there. But we gotta get everyone working together. And I think that's the idea of DevSec, or DevOps, then DevSecOps. I really think we need to add the business to that and then figure out a way to have timelines match reality. How many think the business has a, a realistic expectation of development? <laughs> Two people think the business has, oh God, I wish I worked at your company. It must be startups. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that's the challenge, and I, I'm really curious to see your guys' uh, ideas on that. I read an article, or some, some article came up the other day in my news feed about DevSecOps business being X billions of dollars this year. Uh, so, and that had like the magic quadrant of like DevSecOps companies and like, who, you know, who's going to be involved in this? You know, I'm sure there's some unicorns in there that <laughs> we'd all like to be a part of. But um, I think from the way I look at it is kind of uh, the maturity of a company, right? Like if you are in a older company that has lots of legacy infrastructure and isn't necessarily like, you know, running up in the cloud like some of our startups and unicorns are, uh, DevSecOps is going to be a lot harder, whatever that is, to um, get implemented in a company like mine that's like all up in the cloud and 
our DevOps is solely taking care of, you know, AWS infrastructure and the developers are talking back and forth with the DevOps teams, it's a lot easier to get integrated within that life cycle than it is, you know, on, you know, some company that's running off of an emulated VAX or something like that, which by the way exists. Um, so to me, as a CISO, I'm looking at AppSec and infrastructure security and cloud security and all of that. And to me, it's one, just one big piece. And I think, like you were saying, modeling that for the business is the hardest part of it. And there, therefore, that somehow is uh, DevSecOps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a quick comment. I think um, you know, DevOps has been maturing for, for several years now or, more, or even longer. And what's the value? Right? If you take a step back, what is the value minus the security side of it? Um, it's velocity, right? It's it's taking some of the, the standard change processes and build processes and automating it infrastructure as a code, getting it out. It's a velocity discussion, right? You could talk about it's a quality discussion too and things like that. Adding a security function into DevOps capacity is gonna be an absolutely uphill battle every time. Why? Because they don't think they need security in that. So they can build a container, they can build the process, they can build the, with the code inside this, this bubble of things then deploy it into production. They don't want security in there. Uh, this is my impression, of course. I'm sure there'll be different opinions. Uh, they don't want security in there. Um, because now, that once again, they're calling their baby ugly in a real-time way. So you got to put, you know, my team here, we got to put the strong controls, the gating factors of you can't move your code out of repo until it passes security checks, all those things until it becomes more of a fluid process. And I'm sure many companies have gotten to that fluidity uh, capability. Uh, my experience, though, it is going to be much more of an uphill battle, adding security into it. So. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say I don't really like the term DevSecOps. I don't like anything where I'm you sorry, like I mash them. <laughs> Triggered. Um, yeah, I don't like it when we take multiple things and, and mash them together because I think that when when we do that as a community, each person has a different idea of what it is and what it means. Um, like to me, it just it's pretty simple. Um, it means that we we see what the development process actually is. We see where things are falling flat. You know, where are all the flaws coming up? Um, where do certain teams need more education? Where do certain teams need to slow down? Where would we need to put security automation in there? So it's it's about deconstructing the whole process and then figuring out how we could rebuild it with pieces of security along the way. Um, I think that those of us who are here from Segment um, working at this part of the reason why at midpoint of my career, I was like, forget all these old legacy companies. They don't want to listen to security people. I hate that. Um, that is the reason why this is my second startup in a row is because um, the developers that we work with are more than happy to receive this advice, this counsel, to go through these ex um, extra steps because their nightmare scenario is developing and deploying something that causes or leads to a huge breach that leads to headlines that are really negative. Um, and your reputation in the Valley and SF is really, really important. You don't want to be a developer that's associated with something that is a dumpster fire. Um, so the way that the teams look at us is we are preventing them from falling into that dumpster fire. Um, at times there can be some contention, um, but usually when we take a second and we sit with them and tell them why we're doing this, what's the value of doing this, um, they get it. They realize that we're there to help them. Um, it still does slow things down, um, and it's not a perfect world, but, um, but it's a happier place for us. How many of you in the audience are in companies that are embracing DevOps right now? Wow, almost everyone, okay. Uh, okay, now the tricky question. How many of you are in organizations that have DevSecOps, whatever that is? <laughs> wow, about a third, okay. Should we ask all you guys to come up and define that for us, please? <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, stay in your seats. So, let's, uh, we have another question here for you. Uh, we're getting a little more now into the weeds. We've been talking uh, theory and, and general practice and ideas and philosophy, but let's get into a little bit deeper. So describe your approach to using, if you do, static scanning, dynamic scanning, code review, bug bounties, and pen testing. And Martin, we've, uh, I actually saw you give a talk where you hit on this quite a bit, and I uh, yeah. thought it was fascinating the way you described it. Yeah, um, you know, a little bit of philosophy, you know, Coke versus Pepsi on dynamic and static testing. And static testing is obviously the more mature side of the house. Um, it's a state and point uh, model, um, how we do it, and we're not where we need to be. I'm, you know, very fluid on, on the conversation. 
Uh, we've integrated some automation tools, uh, some companies, I think security companies, and, and some threat modeling capabilities, as well as some automated checks and uh, um, uh, validation processes, you know, st static uh, testing tools, into the repos, into the orchestration processes. Um, and, you know, it, it's, a, it's a double edged sword, right? It's, you know, once again, you're, you're telling a developer, hey, you've made it this far, but you've got these problems to go fix, go back to go, right? Um, and, you know, the, the best answer I've seen, and, you know, and, and Terry from my team is here has really driven this, is, is that's an education opportunity, right? So it's any, like anything. If you find the same problem over and over in the same code with the same developer, turn it into an educational opportunity and, and give them that opportunity to, to get better at that key problem. Um, once again, security tools and automation processes are great, but they're not the answer. They are how do you instruct to get the developer better, because that's really the ultimate, the ultimate goal there. A um, couple points on pen tests are great um, for a point in time model. We're a service provider, so our, our customers are never going to trust us to the point of not having a third party test come in before they use our product. It's just kind of how the, the nature of uh, the, the industry as well. Um, but they're a point in time. So, you know, it's only as good as the assessor's methodology, only as good as the assessor's capabilities. Um, certainly, we don't rely on them, um, but we do do them for, for our, our third parties, our customers, ourselves. Uh, and on bug bounties, um, we've explored them. I think, you know, it's that same opportunity to educate the developer. Um, it's a low cost model, generally speaking, even, you know, the bigger bug bounties are, are not that expensive. Um, and what you're doing is you're getting, you know, once again, nebulous, potentially nebulous testing capabilities against a specific, you know, piece of code or product that you want to have test. But the value is it turns an educate, you turn that into an educational conversation with the developers. It's another checkpoint, it's another third party saying, hey, look, here's how you need to do something a little bit better. Uh, and in that value on that low cost model, I think there, it's a good opportunity for folks. Um, I may be the, maybe one of the only people ever stand down a bug bounty program. <laughs> um, and uh, I found it to be, and perhaps this was just in, in how we executed it, but when I came on board, we didn't really have a security program, but we had a bug bounty program, which was kind of a weird maturity flip, I think. Usually it's security program, then bug bounty program. So I felt like we weren't uh, sophisticated enough to be having something like a bug bounty program. Plus, I found that the submissions weren't really that interesting anyway. <laughs> they weren't really finding issues that um, led much value to uh, my organization. So I've actually taken that and pushed it aside until we're ready to bring it on. But. Um, you know, in terms of pen testing and all that, we do the third party pen testing stuff. I use it also as assurance for um, our third party uh, partners and um, people that we have to assure, like our regulators and so forth. You know, we get our letters of attestation after we fixed everything and that's, that's a really great tool to help expand our business too. It's a really good selling point. As far as like static scanning and dynamic scanning goes, I don't think, in my opinion, there's been much change uh, in the industry uh, in employing it that I could really say we're doing anything ridiculously innovative uh, as opposed to anyone else. But um, I do like uh, contrasts, kind of agent-based uh, security model. But, you know, as I'm, and, and I, I, I haven't actually employed them yet in our environment, but I do like uh, their general approach to it. I also, as I'm sitting through the demos with contrast, can't stop thinking about, and this is a pen tester to me, about how I want to backdoor that thing. Um, but and, and that's kind of the, the inclusion problem that, I, that keeps popping up in my mind. It's like, how are we trusting these static tools too if they're so embedded in our environment? Um, not, not dying on static tools, I really love them. Uh, but it's just kind of an interesting thought I have every time I walk through a demo. <laughs> Sounds like we need to hire you to do some pen tests on our setup. Um, I think that with with your organization, however you're going to grow it, at the end of it, you're going to have a suite of things that are testing your code. Um, there is a lot of value in static and dynamic testing. Um, you know, you'll probably go through a really long POC um, and find things that work, only partially work. Um, the drawbacks that I've encountered with static uh, analysis in the past is lots of tuning, lots of false positives. It takes a lot of time from someone from your team to sit there because you don't want to give that raw report to a developer and say, take a look at these thousands of results and do something about it because that, again, goes against the culture that you're trying to build. Um, you should only give them something that's really actionable. 
Um, so I feel like that's the one that, you know, our organization is kind of putting toward the end because the, the dip that we did with it, it was just not fun. Um, and um, as we're building the suite of, of tools that we're using for testing, I found that, you know, pen tests are really great. I mean, they really help our customers feel good. Uh, they they help our ISO auditors feel great about us. Um, but bug bounty, we've had um, pretty much the opposite uh, experience with them. You know, I think it depends on... Um, the group of researchers who are engaged with your account. Um, we maybe we're really lucky, maybe it's because of the person who runs the program, um, but we have a lot of researchers who have found some really juicy stuff and we are like, thank God they found it and not somebody outside of the company, outside, outside of the company and posting it on Twitter like, hey, segment, I found this thing. You guys are lame. Um, instead, we have the bug bounty researcher writing up this wonderful report for us um, and being able to, like, you know, I, I hate to put it this way, but uh, having a third party like a bug bounty researcher find this and be really good with the explanation, you can weaponize that. Uh, um, and what we found is that when we submit that to the develop development team, everybody scrambles and they're like, we're going to fix this now, right now. So whatever they have going on, they will drop it because they're like, this is a person who doesn't work for our company and doesn't have the advantage of knowing how every piece of it works. And they were able to do this. This is really, really scary. Um, so if, if I look at all of the different things that we have in our suite, that's the one thing that lights a fire under everyone's ass. So, sorry. <laughs> Part of a CISO role is being creative. So, um, you know, I'm working government. You can imagine there's not a whole lot of money there, right? So, we, uh, you know, we, we were developing code and I was, you know, having nightmares because we didn't have good stuff in place. So, I actually identified a grant, wrote a grant proposal and got funding to buy static scanning, uh, also bought dynamic scanning, and actually bought training for developers and security. So, it was really a boom. Thank goodness, so we put that in place. Um, the static scanning, we, we integrated into the uh, SDLC, so that we let that just run with the developers. We don't really get involved in that. Uh, every now and then we'll check it out and remind people, hey, don't bypass that, please. Please check your code in. Uh, the dynamic scanning we run, we work with them, and as Colleen pointed out, you can't just print out the report and give it to them. You gotta sift through it, pull out all the the garbage, pull out a lot of the noise and and work with them because you'll find that, I don't know what percentage, maybe 20% of the vulnerabilities after, after the false positives, about 20% are things that, oh no, here we don't worry about that because we have mitigating controls in place of some other type. So it really doesn't apply. And then you remember that moving forward. But you have to have someone on your security team who's who knows programming, who can sit and talk the language with the developers and, and go through all that stuff. So. What we found was, first we started, well, first we deployed the dynamic scanner, because that's a lot easier than building the static into the infrastructure. And we started finding all these high-risk vulnerabilities, and I'm like, well, thank goodness we're finding them, but oh man, what, what are the coders doing? But then it's not their fault. Most people coming out of school don't have the good security training, right? That's something that is still lacking in our field. It's getting better, right? But if you think about what the colleges and universities are offering, it's not enough security in there, and there could be multiple reasons, another discussion. But what happened was, once we deployed the static scanner and let that work, for the next project, I'm hardly finding any high-risk vulnerabilities in my dynamic scanning now. So I was ecstatic, because it shows that it actually is working. So it's not always going to be the case, but sometimes you can have successes. I, I think the one thing that, that it is important to understand, and Martin hit it at the very beginning, it's not a hammer. It's not, you, if, you, if you run in and say, I'm gonna use static scan and I'm using dynamic scan, and I'm gonna beat my developers up till they get things right, that's not the right way of doing it. The idea is find teachable moments. The idea is we, don't, we shouldn't have to wait for dynamic and static scans for the smart people that work for us to find these things in, in an auto-correct. And the same thing goes through when you say, I'm gonna do my pen test. You, you don't just run a pen test and hand the results over and say, fix all these things, because there may be reasons that those are false positives, right? 
it all has to be teachable moments. It has to be working together as a team, using the tools that make sense. If a bug bounty makes sense, absolutely use it because that's another tool. But if it doesn't make sense, then don't waste time and effort because you can negatively, negatively bias your development community because people are finding stupid things that you really don't care about. So it's, it's taking this, this suite of tools and finding a way to make them work in your environment. I want to get to the question which probably is most important for everyone here. Uh, we talked about this as a team and said, yeah, let, let's end with this. Uh, what's the most important bit of advice you can share with security leaders and developers to help you guys engage together, development team, security team? And um, Colleen, I think that uh, you would express an interest in grabbing this question to help I us did. wrap up. I did, thank you. Um, so part of my team is here, so if you look around, I see David, Leaf and Eric, they're actually trying to hide, or one of them is. Um, and uh, doing AppSec at a startup is, you know, you, you don't know what you're going to get when you show up there. So, so you have Leaf and Eric, you got Vikings. <laughs> <coughs> yes. <laughs> and they have, they have claimed victory um, over at least this one piece of the AppSec program, um, and it is the education program. And so you might think, like, what do people at a startup, cool people at a startup, all these cool developers, what do they care about, like, learning about AppSec? Like, who cares about that stuff? That sounds staid. It sounds boring. Um, the program that they put together teaches some of the basics, like, you know, what is cross-site scripting? How do you recognize it? But also mixed in some things that are very highly relevant to them. So going out and figuring out within our code base where our developers have made these errors um, and teaching developers how do you spot this flaw and oh by the way this is code that we wrote um, and uh, introducing them to juice shop you know like this is how a hacker would take advantage of these flaws that are here this is how you would pair them up this is how you'd actually run an exploit um, and teaching developers to think like a hacker, and that's specifically what this program is about, has been hugely successful, um, even more so than we originally thought in the beginning. So they were writing um, from a developer standpoint, like what would I like to see from security training? Um, so when you're thinking about your security training, don't have your security hat on, have your developer hat on. Like what is it that's missing from the traditional training that you would give them and change it up? because your developers are extremely bright, they're very engaged, they care about the quality of the things that they produce, and they want to partner with the security team. So make it easy for them to do that. Um, and you know, these folks are gonna be here today and tomorrow, you can ask them about some of the elements that go into um, putting together engaging training, but I do know that um, the, the version that we're using right now has a capture the flag element in it and making everybody very, very excited about, like, I can find more vulnerabilities than the person next to me, and being on the leaderboard is something that really re-energized it. It was already a really great program, and then it just went off the charts, um, to the point where, you know, people would actually, um, in Slack channels, and then just tell everybody they know, we love that security training, it's so good. I was so mad when the security training ended. And we would hear these things that we were like, this sounds like some kind of bizarro universe that's not our own. Um, but they were so engaged. Um, and the effect that it's had on the organization is pretty pretty amazing. Um, we've got like a public security channel with the rest of the company. Um, and what we have are developers who are actively hunting for bugs. They're actively hunting for things that are misconfigured, that are a problem, and they're bringing them to our attention. Um, they're not waiting for us to do that. They're actually an extended part of the security team. And I think that's been the most powerful thing for us because your security team is never going to be big enough to keep pace with the rest of the organization. So the secret is it's evangelizing and converting people into this way of thinking about their code. And that's Hallelujah. been helpful. Yeah. Um, I think one thing we all struggle with in this industry is staffing, right? Like, do we have enough people and where do we get them from? And is there enough hands on keyboards and butts and seats? And um, it's something that I'm really passionate about um, as, as a leader in my organization, just getting the right people on my team. So. Um, I would I would really 
um, recommend that we really start looking internally at our folks who may not be on our security team. I know we have the security champion concept, which is great too, but just plucking people out of various parts of the organization that you know aren't necessarily in technology even. Uh, there's a girl on my team who is awesome and she used to be a call center person. You know, She was you know, calling up customers and talking to them and she just happened to have a background in math and turned out to have like incredible aptitude and now she's in security. Um, there was a former coworker of mine who used to be a teacher and you know she had great communication skills and she ended up being a you know a, a, just rising the ranks incredibly fast in security too so uh, my piece of advice there is to kind of as we're you know working with tech recruiters and working with security recruiters and our own internal teams is to also just look under our noses at the people in our organization who have the institutional knowledge, who have the connections with the other teams in the business side and so forth that can really help us out and, and you know, learn that security piece, piece, which is incredibly difficult. But, you know, if they have, if they have the willpower to do so, then their, their opportunity to be great in security and to build up this community as a whole is, is really kind of great. My number one hire in the last two years was our former receptionist. A political science major, loves security, and the guy is a rock star. You never know until you ask. And you'll find people that are really good at, at doing this from really strange places. So I, I'm looking at everybody. If you got a receptionist he thinks pretty smart, I might hire him. Um, yeah, just just the, the idea, uh, you know, SDLC programs in trying to bridge the bridge the security and development uh, integration approach. Um, my experience, there is no magic answer. In some cases, it's going to be some carrots, and it's going to be um, there's going to be some developers who are absolutely excited about security um, and want to learn and know everything about it. And then sometimes it's a stick, and you know, it's part of part of being the CISO is you got to sometimes you know do the stick and the carrot both. Um, and you know every culture is unique. Every company is unique. Um, you know the security champion ideas and those kind of things are really embedding you know some product managers into the life cycle and having them. I'd love to see. I don't have this today. I'd love to see a product ma a product security manager um, and focus solely on the product side of things, um, which we've got people doing that now, but not at, at a dedicated role. Um, but you know just you got to balance right in a management role. You got to balance the carrot and the stick model. Um, put in the automation. I think that is absolutely valuable and has, has provided, you know, provided the, at least the recognition that there are problems that there need to be solved. False positives and static, you know, static scanning is always a problem. But you know, risk rank those. Find out what's important to you and your organization. And if you need to use the stick, use the stick. Um, you know, it sounds terrible. You know, everybody wants to say everybody, everybody's kumbaya and all that, but it's it's not right. Um, and you know, just manage that appropriately in, in both ways. Thank you, wonderful stuff. Give, let's give them a round of applause, please. <laughs> we're pretty much out of time, but because we're up against a vendor break, um, maybe we can steal two minutes for one question. Uh, we've got somebody right there. You can yell it out. Sure, I'll you. repeat it. Thank you for taking my question. Thank you for taking my question. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> So he's, he's a member of the team who wants to know how we can effectively manage upwards? Okay. He's a member of the development team. Of the development team. Thank you. Uh, I'll give it a shot. Um, you know, visibility. Um, you, know, uh, you know, sometimes you maybe get lost in the shuffle in those, you know, and so getting visibility of what you're thinking about. I know most people in the technology world, and I think this is honestly true, are not just doing their day job. They are going home, they're reading, they're thinking, they're doing POCs. Um, and get visibility of that. As a leader, I like to see that on my teams to see how you guys are thinking about innovation. It may not apply, it may apply, who knows? But how are you getting you know, your, your education, your skill set up? And maybe you're doing some cool things in the cloud that you wanna show you know, cool things about how that could apply to your company. Get that visibility up and um, I'm sure everybody in the, you know, the leadership will, will recognize that. Um, I think I, I only got part of the question. You wanted to know, um, so you're a member of a development team and you want to get visibility to the executives, um, but what is it that you want to share with them or what do you want to change in the org?
Is this ah. for you personally or for the team? No, in general. In general. Yeah, so um, one thing I've learned working with executives is uh, they don't want to get in trouble. So <laughs> here's what you can do. Um, you can work with your security team to maybe compile some reports, uh, stats on the types of flaws that you have. Maybe there's a, a particular disturbing pattern or whatever it is that keeps coming up. Um, and maybe even like throw some metrics in front of them and then maybe even do a demo of how easy it is to pair up a few of these different flaws and run a really scary exploit. And then make them aware that as members of the executive suite, when a risk that's like been really well culled and you know cultivated and you bring it up to them and they decide to ignore it, it's off of your chest and it's now onto theirs. No executive wants to be wearing an orange jumpsuit. They don't want to be in the headlines. So just make it very, very clear for them that you and the security team worked together and you were able to mine this information. And thank God you and they found it because if somebody from the outside found this and did this, then the executive team would be in a lot of trouble. Um, it really is about like partnering visibility, but making sure it's in black and white. You show them like, we found this risk. It is this easy to own our infrastructure. All a person has to do is combine this, this, and this. I will do a demo for you to show you that. Um, that kind of stuff, it, it's like the, the dare stuff in the 80s. It gets them scared straight. So um, we can talk more about that if you'd like. Right. Will you guys be here uh, throughout the day? Yeah. Okay, look for them if you have some more questions because we have to go. Uh, please, I encourage everybody, go visit our vendors by the pool. They've got a lot of cool stuff, and they have great solutions you can discuss with them. Plus, if we don't visit them, next year it's only pizza. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's give them their due and thank them for uh, their sponsorship. Uh, the, the CTF and the IoT Village are throughout the day and tomorrow, too. Half-hour break, then back to sessions. Enjoy, and thank you again, panel. Thank you.